Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. For today's episode, I'll be looking at The Nature of Economies by Jane Jacobs, published in 2000. Uh, Jane Jacobs was most well known for her book, uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which I have uh, listened to as an audiobook. I haven't actually physically read it, but I listened to it as an audiobook and I was very impressed with it. Uh, and this book here is also very good. Uh, it draws comparisons between the way an economy works and the way an ecosystem works. And it's actually very interesting. Uh, it's written in the form of a dialogue, uh, which in some sense helps and in some sense hurts the book. I suspect that she wrote it that way. Her other books are not written that way. But I suspect that she wrote it that way because the ideas that she had were fairly tentative. And it may be that she didn't really have the expertise uh, to write a proper treatise uh, on the sort of ecological aspects of what she was talking about. Um, and I think she may have just wanted to get some r more of a rough outline of some ideas out there. And so she presented it as a dialogue where there are people talking and one of them is going to write a book, but he's sort of explaining his ideas of the book he's going to write to the other people that he's talking to. And so we only ever really get the outline of what the book would be uh, and the conversations around it. So in some sense, it doesn't really get into a tremendous amount of detail for that reason. Uh, that may be deliberate. So that's uh, kind of a downside to the book if you're looking to get a real uh, meaty, substantive work. I think what's happening here is she's more laying the groundwork and then perhaps some other person is going to have to come along and pick up where she left off. Uh, but there are interesting ideas here, and I tend to agree with much of what she says. Uh, we hear talk about how um, a free market sort of is a, is a uh, spontaneous order where prices will set themselves according to equilibrium, and the forces of supply and demand just kind of spontaneously arise, and it's not a controlled economy, but more of a hands-off economy, a laissez-faire economy will, will direct itself, it will kind of do its own thing, and the, the method by which it does its own thing is a sort of organic process. It follows along themes of development and themes of distribution that can uh, also be seen in the natural world. There's sort of natural processes that are that are being undertaken in the in the growth and expansion and sustaining of an economy over time, which is an interesting theory. I think that she's right, and I think that this probably this probably could stand to be explored in more depth. So there are a few sections here that I want to read. I am going to basically extract material from this out of the dialogue form uh, so that I, I'm, I'm not going to read, well, so-and-so said this, and then this person said, oh, really? Um, I'm just kind of cutting and pasting here a little bit to put together some sections that has the dialogue aspects of this kind of filtered out. And we can just get the basic premise of what the, the, the main speaker, the one who is going to write this book, uh, the things that he says. We can kind of get, get in here and see what his ideas are. So for that reason, it's not going to sound like a dialogue when I read it. But um, in, in reality, this is presented in the form of a dialogue. So I'm going to read a few sections like I always do. The first ones I'm going to read are about a couple of principles of development. Um, and in this section, she says, quote, Rivers develop deltas by depositing silt. Waves develop sandbars. Volcanic eruptions develop mountains. Weather systems develop fronts and storms. Means of development vary enormously. A rabbit embryo and a bean sprout don't develop by exactly the same means, even though they're both alive. Yet an animal, a plant, 
a delta, a legal code, or an improved shoe sole. They all develop on the same underlying process for development. 19th century embryologists and evolutionists were the first to try to seriously understand the development of one form from another as a natural process. The gist of their definitions of development was this, differentiation emerging from generality. Only four words, but they describe development on every scale of time and size, whether inanimate or animate. To take an example on a huge scale, consider the solar system. According to astronomers and physicists, it seems once to have been a vast cloud of matter. That was a generality. Differentiations emerged. The sun, fellow planets, and their moons, along with various smaller debris, left over generalized matter. Now the next important point. Once the Earth emerged as a differentiation, it became a new generality from which further differentiations could emerge. From the crust, in due course, emerged differentiations. So here's the second universal principle of development. Differentiations become generalities, from which further differentiations emerge. In other words, development is an open-ended process which creates complexity and diversity because multiplied generalities are sources of multiplied differentiations some occurring simultaneously in parallel, others in successions. Thus, a simple basic process, when repeated and repeated and repeated, produces staggering diversity. On a tiny scale, say an embryonic human being, the generality is a microscopically small fertilized egg. At first, it divides into repetitions of itself, forming a blob of multiplied generality. The first differentiations to emerge, depending on their locations in the blob, are layers of three distinctly differentiated kinds of cells called ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. These three differentiations are also three new generalities, from which more and more differentiations can emerge, both simultaneously and in successions, producing the diverse and complicated tissues and organs of the, de the developing baby. In the infant's reproductive organ, a preserve of undifferentiated eggs or sperm is set aside for producing the next generation's differentiations. End quote. Here she presents two uh, principles of development. The first one, differentiation emerges from generality. And the second one, differentiations become generalities from which further differentiations emerge. Seems sort of fractal-like. You have a thing, the thing divides into components, this part and that part, the sun and the planets, you know, the inner cells or the outer cells of an embryo developing in different directions. And then each thing each direction that is like a differentiation a, a aspect of the generality will itself divide into more differentiations and this is how complexity comes about it seems a little um, intuitive but it's important to point it out there's there's a process that happens here and it's duplicated in matter in ideas in economies it's a sort of basic framework for development and complexity so then there's the third principle of development uh, in which she says, quote, A horse requires more than its own ancestors. A horse implies grass. Grass implies topsoil. Topsoil implies breakup of rocks, development of fungi, worms, beetles, compost-making bacteria, animal droppings, no end of other evolution and lineages besides that of the horse. It's the last of three fundamental development principles. Development depends on co-developments. I mean that development can't usefully be thought of as a line or even a collection of open-ended lines. It operates as a web of interdependent co-developments. No co-development web, no development. A delta needs both water and grit. Neither by itself can develop a delta, and each by itself is a result of co-developments. As a practical matter, development doesn't occur in isolation. Every animal cell, including each of our own cells, of course, carries with it descendants of bacteria called mitochondria, which have their own lineage different from that of the cell in which they live. Mitochondria have their own genetic material. They evolved separately. But now they and our cells are symbionts, mutually dependent, although originally they may have co-developed as predators and prey. 
mitochondria power our cells, generate energy by combining sugar and oxygen. Cells of green plants benefit from co-developed symbionts called chloroplasts, which capture sunlight and use it as energy to free carbon, the basic food of plants, from carbon dioxide. The waste product of chloroplasts is oxygen, which animals require. The waste product of mitochondria is carbon dioxide, which plants require. Neither plants nor animals would have a feasible atmosphere to draw on or live in without the other. End quote. So there you have kind of point three is that many developments, probably most developments, depend on other factors in the environment, other things going on in the world. Uh, they cannot develop along certain lines until and unless there are other developments uh, present in the same environment. So she talks about the horse, and the horse depends on the existence of the grass, and the grass depends on the soil, and all of these things depend on other processes occurring, and none of it can develop in isolation. So the third principle here is that every development de depends on co-developments. So again, this doesn't sound uh, extremely um, unexpected. It all sort of makes sense as to, to the way things develop and change over time. Uh, so now there's more here about the, uh, the fact that this all sounds very cooperative uh, and the nature of this kind of network or cooperation or ecosystem of, of entities is discussed here when she says, quote, an ecologist in Oregon, back home from Botswana, told me about the honeybird, a drab little thing notable for being able to digest beeswax. It can't get at honey or wax by itself because it would be stung to death. So it enlists human help by getting the attention of a hunter and leading him to a hive. The hunter overcomes the bees with a smudge fire, breaks open the hive, and shares the goodies with the bird. But the honeybird has one other species of helpers, small skunk-like mammals. Naturalists suppose these were the bird's traditional helpers. Same routine. The bird gets the attention of one of these creatures, leads it on, the animal backs up to the hive, sprays it with his powerful odor, breaks into the hive, and shares its goodies with the bird. Even among human neighbors, where cooperation indisputably exists, it can be inadvertent. My tenant told me he misses me when I'm out of town because he depends on hearing my morning alarm clock, inadvertent cooperation on my part. Competition is there, and so are winners and losers. Losers die and winners eat. The honeybird, skunk-like mammal, and hunter are predators, and the hive is prey. But that's not the whole cast of characters. The bees and their honey wouldn't exist without flowers, but the flowers wouldn't exist without bees, and so on. Put it this way, competitions for feeding and breeding take place in an arena. The arena is a habitat. The fittest panther in the jungle is a goner if its habitat goes. And what is a habitat? It's an intricate, complicated web of interdependencies." End quote. So again, here you have something that I've kind of been hinting at at various points throughout uh, my podcast, which is that nature has this balance between cooperation and competition. Uh, it cannot, the competition cannot exist without the underlying uh, ecosystem, but the ecosystem is just a network of relations. And the existence of a network of relations might imply some sort of cooperation, but uh, in practice, the cooperation is often inadvertent or uh, selfish. Like the bird that wants the honey goes to, like before, before the hunters, they said it would uh, originally would go to a uh, skunk, small skunk-like mammal attract its attention, the mammal would spray the hive with its, you know, skunk spray or whatever, dispersing the bees, and then the mammal would open the hive and share the honey with the bird. None of this is probably extremely deliberate or alt altruist, certainly not altruistic. The bird and the mammal both want something from each other. They cooperate to get it, but they're in it for themselves. Um, the bees are the prey. The bees are getting their uh, honey taken from them, their hive broken open, and uh, their whole system that they've worked so hard to, to build up 
destroyed and consumed by a couple of uh, what seems to the bees probably giant monsters. Uh, there's competition everywhere. The cooperation is is generally not intended. It's inadvertent cooperation. It's selfish cooperation. Um, the competition is always there. And so even though it might look like this ecosystem of interrelated things like the bees depend on the flowers and the flowers depend on the bees, again, they're really using one another for their own... I mean, the bees are in it for the pollen to feed on the pollen from the flowers. And any sort of benefit to the flowers is inadvertent, clearly. Um, so the, the bees are using the flowers, and the flowers are using the bees to their own benefit with their bright colors and stuff. They want the bees to come eat the pollen because it helps to spread the pollen and in the end is better for more successful flowers. The cooperation is almost entirely inadvertent, um, truly, in the, in, the, in the ecosystem, and yet it sort of has this appearance of, this appearance of interrelations and, and codependencies Anyway, let's move on from there. Uh, we begin to talk about how an ecosystem develops and expands over time. And in this section, she says, quote, The most amazing demonstration of expansion is the sheer volume and weight of biomass on the Earth. It expanded from nothing before life began and now includes the huge conglomeration of Earth's plants and animals, among them, of course, billions of human beings. Earth's biomass is even larger than we commonly notice. Microorganisms are thought to account for as much as 75 or 80 percent of total biomass volume, maybe more. Microbiologists now think that more microorganisms live deep underground than at or near the surface. Bacteria even live underneath glacial ice. Added to all the living things are stored remains, fossil fuels, compost, and worm droppings in the topsoil, ancient seashells composing chalk, limestone, travertine, and marble, wooden beams of buildings, paper, the clothes you're wearing, and trillions upon trillions of other relics of lives lived. There couldn't have been that expansion and diversity without development and co-development. Development and expansion are tightly interlocked. They make each other possible. But the puzzle is how. Theoretically, each successful new thing might crowd out an equivalent volume of old things. Yet that doesn't happen, not in economic life or in the rest of nature. Why not? Let's think about how biomass expands. You can see the phenomena in abandoned cornfields, say, or barren tobacco fields, where the bare dirt doesn't even have a cropped grass cover at first. But left to itself, an abandoned field is invaded by vagrant seeds that produce a sporty crop of weeds. At first, hardly enough per acre to make a decent covering for the bottom of a wheelbarrow. Gradually, hardy burdock and thistles are joined by more delicate chickweed, dandelions, tufts of wild grass, vines, bramble shrubs, pioneer saplings, lichens, and moss, until every inch of soil is tenanted. Yet strangely enough, expansion of the biomass continues, and even more rapidly than when there seemed to be more room for expansion. Saplings grow taller, then are crowded out by still taller species. Patches of violets thicken, undergrowth tangles more tightly. The scant animal life of worms, beetles, ants, and butterflies is joined by other insect species, along with birds, little mammals, and who knows how many more variety of bacteria multiplying in leaf mold, animal droppings, and corpses. A few bobcats or a pair of foxes sneak in and join mice, shrews, voles, skunks, rabbits, snakes, woodpeckers, and owls. At some point, the Noah's Ark part of the restoration is complete. All the current species in the vicinity who will find the environment congenial have come aboard. Yet the biomass still expands. Trees get larger, moss thicker, Vines longer, seeds more abundant, mushrooms bulgier, earthworms fatter, squirrels more abounding, lichens lumpier. What are they expanding on? The rich environment? But the ensemble itself made the environment rich by expanding. How can this be? The sun comes into it, very much so. A so-called self-sustaining system is not really self-sustaining, of course. It needs infusion of energy from outside itself. That's true of every system on the planet, including weather, river, and ocean systems. We ourselves need fuel. Machines need fuel, 
or some other kind of propelling energy, like horse or manpower. The energy sources of some kinds of microorganisms seem to be infusions of heat and chemicals from the interior Earth, but with that exception, the ultimate source of Earth's energy infusions is sunlight. In an ecosystem, chloroplasts living symbiotically in plant cells capture raw sunlight, and from that point on, the energy infusions which organisms receive are conversions of the sun's energy. But energy infusions are only the first half of the energy story. The second half is energy discharge. Eventually, a system discharges all the energy it receives. Energy matter can be converted from various forms to various other forms, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. To be sure, it can be stored for short or long periods, as in corpses before they decay. Timber, books, buildings, fossil fuel, even limestone. Ultimately, a system's discharged energy is lost to it by radiating outward. That's why all living systems need either continued or sporadic infusions of new energy. So an ecosystem can be thought of as a conduit through which energy passes, with many or few transformations of energy slash matter during its trip through the conduit. The interesting question is what happens in the conduit. In some ecosystems, not much happens. Sunlight falling on a desert barren of life heats sands and rocks, but when night falls, even that quantity of temporarily retained energy radiates outward. In this case, the passage of energy is swift, simple, and vanishing, leaving no evidence of the passage. It must have been like this when sunlight fell on Earth's primordial rocks and empty seas before life began. Deserts aren't as bereft of life as they may seem, but because they lack water, or near the poles because of cold, only a pittance of a desert's received energy is stored in tissues or discharged in metabolic, neural, and muscular activities. The same can be said also of sunlight falling on warm and well-watered but paved-over land or poisonously polluted lakes. Contrast that with energy flow through a well-developed forest ecosystem. In the forest, energy flow is anything but swift and simple because of the diverse and roundabout ways that the system's web of teeming, interdependent organisms uses energy. Once sunlight is captured in the conduit, it's not only converted, but repeatedly reconverted, combined and recombined, cycled and recycled, as energy slash matter is passed around from organism to organism. Energy flow through an intricate conduit of this kind is dilatory and digressive. It leaves behind in complex webs of life, ample evidence of its passage. No other terrestrial ecosystems can compete with tropical rainforests in sheer variety of species. At first thought, it seems as if the tropics' warmth throughout the year and the blazing power of tropical sunlight must be responsible for the abundance. However, when a tropical forest is cleared, the soil bakes and hardens. Rainfall also turns destructive leaching minerals out of soil no longer interlaced with roots and protected by forest canopy. For those reasons, crop yields are typically mediocre, dwindling so rapidly that after a few years the land is hardly worth planting. Merely in themselves, sun and rain and even atmosphere and soil don't account for either biomass expansion or biomass variety. The answer is the forest's multiple uses of energy, received within its conduit before the energy is finally discharged from the system. Multiple energy use requires diverse, interdependent users. The principle can be stated like this. Expansion depends on capturing and using transient energy. The more different means a system possesses for recapturing, using, and passing around energy before it's discharged from the system, the larger are the cumulative consequences of the energy it receives. End quote. So that was clearly a longer section, uh, but it's very important, I think, some of the points that are being made here. So she talks about uh, like a, an empty field. You know, she talks about how the, the biomass of Earth has expanded and expanded, and you could see the same phenomena in an empty field, where the empty field becomes abundantly filled with life over time. How does the biomass of life expand in that area? 
Um, there's clearly there's like sunlight coming in, there's nutrients in the soil, some basic nutrients in the soil of some sort and the sunlight, even, even there you've got uh, influence from outside the field. Life doesn't spontaneously form in the field, but seeds and things will come in. Birds will fly into the field and they will leave droppings or they will drop seeds or things will blow in. And there, so there's clearly there's influence from outside the field, but things take root and over time they begin to expand into more and more different types of plants, different types of animals. As there are more plants, there's more food for animals to eat. They begin to come in and munch on the leaves. Predators come in. Over time, things grow. The trees get taller. The lichen gets lumpier, as she says. The whole thing gets more robust, more types of creatures, and more creatures of any particular type, larger, fatter, healthier creatures. There's an expansion. And she says, you know, the, what really matters is how much the energy is cycled through the uh, ecosystem. When sunlight falls on a barren desert, the energy comes in, it heats the desert, and then as it cools, the energy leaves the desert. So it's in, it's stored for a moment, and then it's back out again. Whereas in a forest, the light comes in, the plants convert that into energy, they use the energy to transform nutrients in the soil and water into the structures of their forms. They're creating mat matter, they're, they're creating structure of plant life. This is then in turn feeds the animals, so it's converted to energy again, then the, it, it powers the animals, processes, it becomes matter, the animal is consumed by another animal, turns into energy again, it's cycled, it's cycled and cycled and cycled through multiple life forms. And some of it dissipates into the atmosphere as, you know, body heat is radiated from the animals and so on and so forth. But largely speaking, it's, it's creating a better storage system for energy and it's seeing the energy multiply. And that kind of capacity for the energy to multiply and cycle through repeatedly through the ecosystem creates the abundance. And this does come back to economics. This does, in fact, come back to economics because you see the same sort of thing in an economy. So there's a section here where uh, she talks at some length about uh, imports and exports and whether imports uh, are, are more important than exports to an economy. Um, I'm not going to read it. It seems like neither of the characters really have a good grasp of what they're talking about. I think her, her real point comes in when uh, when she talks about like comparing an, a, a community that only, say you've got a community that only imports, uh, well, let's say they they all they do is make one thing. Say there's a big mine in town and all the people work in the mine. Everybody in town works in the mine. And all the stuff that f comes out of the mine gets exported out of the town with the exception maybe of a tiny amount uh, for them to use. But most of it gets exported. All of the food, all of the stuff, the belongings, all gets imported. And so it's, it's, like, it's kind of like that desert where the sunlight shines, the, the resource comes in and immediately goes back out again. And it doesn't cycle through at all. Whereas a, a community that has a whole array of manufacturing, like... We talked about in, in the last episode and in previous episodes, this balance of manufacturing, agriculture, commerce. There's just a, a cycling in one community where all of the different tasks are, are, are occurring. So the food is created, sold to the manufacturer, the manufacturer is creating things. And none of this has to leave the community. It's cycled through the community multiple times. And so there's a sort of um, value there in like the multiple sort of multiplier effect that you hear of occurring within a community um, that helps the community to expand and thrive. I, th I felt like that was a pretty interesting concept. So here uh, she talks about self refueling, uh, where she says, "quote Well, the the people in the the characters in the dialogue have just eaten dinner. I guess that would make this make more sense." She says, quote, we've refueled ourselves, but if we think we're now at leisure, we're mistaken. 
For our own purposes, each of us is busily converting clams, salad, bread, wine, and strawberries into energy. We'll each use part of this energy to acquire more food for ourselves, other meals. I'm drawing your attention to one of the two main characteristics of self-refueling systems. Part of the energy each takes in from outside itself is spent to capture subsequent infusions of energy, and part of that is to capture more infusions, and so on repeatedly. The other main characteristic of self-refuelers is that they possess equipment appropriate to the fuel they use. Suitable equipment is so important that its breakdown is as fatal to an organism as the disappearance of its fuel. Appropriate equipment is the self of self-refueling. Cows are equipped to feed on grass, but we aren't. Termites get along on wood, but cows can't. Appropriate equipment often includes symbiotic bacteria as well as suitable food capturing and digesting equipment. Because of the necessary matches between equipment and fuel, self-refueling systems are finicky. Each system has its own integrity as a discrete tangible unit. One organism's waste is another organism's dinner. Self-refueling has no generalized form, only many, many specific forms. End quote. So just a brief section there, um, self-refueling sort of comes into like how, let's say, this field that's now a thriving ecosystem, uh, it still gets in new infusions. It, it has the sun, which is just given to it freely, but uh, it also has infusions of material from uh, external areas, but nothing has to really work. Nothing has to work to get the sun. I mean, there, there's certainly there's a sort of labor involved inside the plant, um, to, to get specific about it, if the plant is self-refueling, uh, it has to do something to get that. So it has to devote a portion of the energy that it receives from the sun. It has to devote a portion of that energy toward the construction of mechanisms to process the sunlight. So the chloroplast or what have you, the various internal mechanisms have to be created. So a portion of its energy is devoted to the acquisition of more energy. This is more apparent in animals where a portion of the energy that they uh, acquire from their food is then diverted toward the acquisition of additional food. In the same sense, a community has uh, some sort of export-import process and that itself is a sort of refueling, gaining new ideas. If you, if you purchase products from some technologically advanced uh, land, you are, you are gaining uh, intellectual uh, property that you can then like, try to create that thing yourself. There's a, there's a process. I mean, if it wasn't beneficial to a community to engage in this trade, it wouldn't be happening. Things are coming into the community that it cannot create for itself. And in a way, this is a community engaging in a sort of self-refueling process. That's the, that's the process by which a, a, a singular system um, reacquires the energy and resources that it, that it needs that it's continually giving off. Self-refueling. And, and, and economies and communities do this as well. So now we've, we really start finally getting into a little bit more about economies here. There's been a lot of discussion about ecosystems, or at least in the parts that I've read. But here I want to talk a little bit more about uh, economies. So she says, quote, We hardly recognize a settlement to have become a little city until it has experienced an abrupt burst of unusually rapid growth, during which it has filled itself out with at least all the goods and services that are commonly produced locally in little cities of its time and place, but which the settlement earlier imported. All great cities, now we're looking at this process on a big scale, have experienced repeated bursts of import replacing and shifting. These bursts, when they occur in large cities, are mighty economic forces. Remember the anomalies of Los Angeles and Shakespeare's London, both of which flourished mysteriously while their exports happened to be in serious decline. Replacements of imports are imitative, but not always slavishly imitative. They commonly incorporate economically advantageous improvisations in materials or in methods of production, and sometimes changes in design. If imitations improve items, replacements are especially apt to become successful exports such as Japanese sewing machines, to mention one example of thousands. Sewing machines 
first reached Japanese cities as imports from America, where they'd been invented. In Japan, although they were expensive, they were popular. Locally made replacements, starting in Tokyo, cost less than imports because of improvised economical production methods. Instead of being produced in expensive integrated factories like the imports, the replacements were produced as bits and pieces in many small, already existing machine shops and were assembled by contractors. The production paid for itself as it grew, rather than requiring risky large initial outlays. Next, these machines became exports from Tokyo to other Japanese cities, many of which also replaced them with local production, adding their own improvements and changes adapted to local uses of the machines. This is how Japan eventually generated some 800 sewing machine companies and became the, wor became the world's preeminent producer, especially of machines for doing various specialized types of industrial stitching. Japanese cameras, radios, cars, and business suits are replaced imports, but, except for the suits, not slavish imitations. Import replacing extends back into time immemorial. Archaeologists call it economic borrowing, and prehistorians call it dissemination, or less accurately, diffusion of techniques. This is a process that enables cities to capture new imports without drawing upon payments for exports. Look at it this way. When a settlement's economy shifts to purchasing new imports as an automatic consequence of replacements, that economy has everything it formerly had plus the new imports to which it has shifted. Some shifted imports go into replacement work, others are pure extras, additional energy received into the conduit from outside as surely as if they'd been bought with payments for export work. But they're acquired by means that bypass necessity for added export payments." End quote. So that's a little tricky to understand what she's saying here, but she's talking about import replacement. So that, for example, Japanese imported sewing machines from America where they'd been invented. They liked them. They were expensive to import, obviously, from very far away. Uh, but they liked the sewing machines, and they began to create sewing machines of their own. Right? None of this seems like really extraordinary. They decided, we don't need to pay all this money for these imported sewing machines. We have machine shops. They, one machine shop would make this part, another would make that part, and people would contractors would assemble the parts and put them together. It was sort of like a jerry-rigged version, I think, of the sewing machine. Uh, but over time, they got better at it, and they are now really like the world's leading sewing machine makers. They, re they imported them, and then they started making them. That's called import replacement. So now the imports uh, to Japan are something else. The imports have shifted from sewing machines to some other thing. Um, and the idea here is that there's something that's coming into the Japanese economy that they don't have to pay for. And while they have to pay for the sewing machines themselves, they don't have to put in the time and effort necessary to inventing the sewing machines. There's a lot of Right? There's a lot of experimentation, there's a lot of thought processes that go in, there's a lot of engineering that's going in, and various activities that are leading up to the invention of the sewing machine. And then Japan can import sewing machines and can just sit down and start making them. They can take them apart, look at them, understand them, and sit down and start making them. So in a sense, Japan has acquired something through the, through the imports that they didn't actually have to pay for. They didn't have to pay for it through the research and development process. And so there, that's like an infusion of, of, of expertise so that the Japanese economy becomes more, more diversified. They didn't used to have a sewing machine industry, and now they do. And now the, the money cycles through the Japanese industry more, more times because they're no longer importing the, uh, the sewing machines. And so the Japanese economy grows in the same way that the empty field grows because something comes from without, enters the field, and then takes root and multiplies and creates additional diversity. So in that way, the, the economies can expand and grow by taking up from one another the things that have developed elsewhere. And then the last section that I want to read uh, is when she talks a little bit about Adam Smith. And this section will tie it back a little bit to some of the things that we have been previously 
discussing, where she says, quote, Adam Smith observed that prices rise for goods in short supply and fall for goods in low demand. That kind of thing is feedback. Now, for corrections, it triggers. Smith also observed that high prices for goods stimulated increased production of those goods, and that low prices depressed production, automatically bringing supplies into closer correspondence with demand. He also applied this insight to facets of economic life other than production of goods. For instance, he noticed that wages rise when and where the demand for labor is high, and fall when and where it's in low demand. This influences migrations of workers when such movements are possible, and also workers' choices of occupations when that's feasible. When and where capital is in high demand, interest rates rise and attract capital. Such continual adjustments by industry, labor, customers, landowners, and capital create self-organized order out of volatile, uncoordinated, confusing conglomerations of countless different enterprises and individuals, narrowly pursuing countless picayune opportunities and their own interests. So Smith was also far ahead of his time in identifying the phenomena we now call self-organization and illustrating its behavior in a non-hierarchically organized dynamic system. Smith shared with his contemporaries many naive and obfuscating misconceptions about the world and the way it works. Nevertheless, these insights of his placed economics in 1775 at a forefront of scientific inquiry. No wonder early ecologists drew on economics to explain their own discoveries. Unfortunately, economics failed to progress much further as a science. It had this one solid concept in its grasp, and economists and economic philosophers tried to make it explain too much. They dwelled on arid arguments about whether supply generates demand or demand generates supply, arguments that continue to this day. As we've seen, diversity generates economic expansion, owing to multiple reuses of settlements' imports. In principle, just as diversity of organisms generates biomass expansion owing to multiple reuses of received energy before it leaves the conduit. But although the close empirical connection between economic diversity and expansion was observable in Smith's time and has been observable ever since, the connection slid unnoticed, past economic theorists arrested in their obsession with whether demand leads to supply or vice versa. Smith himself was partly responsible for that blind spot. He led himself and others astray by declaring that economic specialization of regions and nations was more efficient than economic diversification. His mistake came of flawed assumptions and extrapolations concerning division of labor. To this day, no attention is paid to self-refueling as a complex but orderly process. And only in the mid-20th century did schools of economics so much as acknowledge that innovation, development, was worth exploring, and even then only as an eccentric and marginal side issue. And even today, there is no useful attention paid to the systematic workings of development and co-development. The pity is that this intellectual stultification was so unnecessary. The theorists, after Smith, retreated into their own heads instead of engaging ever more deeply with the real world. Plenty of observable, germane facts were lying around in plain sight, ready and waiting to lead Smith's insights, straight as directional arrows, into the subjects of development and bifurcations. It could easily have been seen by anyone, for instance, that high prices stimulate substitutes for goods in short supply, that is, stimulate production of goods not previously in existence. In 15th century Europe, the demand for books exceeded the supply of individually hand-copied books. That particular imbalance made printing with movable type economically feasible. Printed books were not only more plentiful than hand copies, but cheaper than even those produced by poor, half-starved student drudges in cold, ill-lit garrets. Or take metal plating, an important industrial advance even before Smith's time, and observable in many permutations ever since. The innovation that launched it in London was a lower-priced substitute for sterling silver handles for table knives. In both printing and plating, and many other instances, Disparate supplies and demands were brought into better balance only by developments. 
pursuing Smith's insights could have led straight into appreciation of code development webs and would have thrown deep suspicion on economic specialization and also on the supposed efficiency of monopolies and on the deliberately specialized economic arrangements of imperial powers, which have worked so much harm on the world's economies and the people who depend on them. As for refueling, London, for one, was subject to enormous bursts of replacements of former imports. So were other European cities. Since these replacements were largely, not entirely, but largely driven by the lower costs of locating close to markets instead of at a distance, Smith's insights might have led to understanding why some economies, by diversifying, also became self-generating, while others are dependent and inert. All these investigations would have been more fruitful than theories about how economies should work or might work or could be manipulated into how they should or might work instead of learning how they do work. End quote. So that kind of ties it all together there with a discussion of Adam Smith. And Adam Smith, what she's talking about is Adam Smith's discovery of the division of labor uh, and his, his focus on the efficiency of division of labor. You can think about the pins and the pin factory and how when each person sort of just learns how to do one thing and specializes in it and does it repeatedly, then a group of people working at a sort of assembly line type of feature could be much, much more productive than an equivalent number of people each sitting at their own little workbench making pins start to finish. This division of labor is a very important insight of Adam Smith's, uh, and he tries to apply it to nations, and it doesn't apply to nations quite as completely and entirely as he would like it to, uh, because the nations and the cities grow and expand as they achieve their diversity as they're able to allow for economic activity to multiply within the community, to continue to cycle within a community like energy cycling within an ecosystem, having a diverse economy allows that cycling. Whereas having an economy that's not diverse because it's dependent only on exporting one or a few things, because of this specialization advocated by Adam Smith, that doesn't take into account the multipl multiplying effects of, of money and resources cycling through a, a, an, an economy multiple times. So really interesting way of looking at uh, the organic uh, na nature of development, bifurcation, diversification, um, the import replacement, the, the growth and expansion of natural environments and of economies and the way that they are related to one another, I find that all really interesting. Um, and I think that it supports uh, some of the more protectionist economic concepts. And I think also that some of the principles of development that you see in eco ecologies, while they duplicate themselves in some form in economies, I think you'll find that they also duplicate themselves in some form in cultures because culture and tradition is really just a sort of uh, ecosystem of its own. Uh, but with, without getting in depth into that, I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. I thank you very much for listening and I hope you tune in again next time. Bye.